now we finally get to electric fields. All this, uh, this is the title of the lecture, so this is really what it's all about, electric fields. Electric fields are analogous to gravitational fields, and we express the gravitational field by g, that little g vector. g can be measured in meters per second squared, but typically we prefer to measure it in newtons per kilogram because that's a way to express a field. How many newtons would of gravity would be on it if you for each kilogram you put in that field? Um, the electric field, which we use the symbol E for, it's just an aura that surrounds charged objects and exerts a force on other charged objects. Field models, why we love to use them, they're very useful to describing all kinds of interactions that occur at a distance. Uh, right now, we're being affected by the gravity of the sun, even though that's millions of miles away. Um, electric fields are similar, uh, and uh, notice that electric fields are actually real things. They are detectable phenomena, and they can exist independently of charged objects, because a lot of people say, well, why do we even need this field concept? Let's just use charges exerting a force on each other with Coulomb's law. You can have electric fields without any charges present. Uh, in a light wave, you've got electric fields. Those are alternating electric and magnetic fields. A generator coil, you can produce electric fields without any bare charge, any just negatives all by themselves or positives all by themselves. You can get an electric field. So electric fields are real, and um, they are very, very useful for us to understand stuff. The electric fields are vectors. They have a magnitude and they have a direction, and we typically assign a field value to every point in space. So every point in space, uh, where if you're around a charge, or even if you're not, we say, okay, what's the electric field at that point, at that point, at that point? So every point may have a different magnitude and direction of electric field. Now, here's how we define this mathematically. We define electric fields like so. This is like super fundamental. This is really, really important right here. This equation is kind of at the center of everything. The electric field is defined as the force per unit charge. Uh, F is the electric force, which is exerted on an infinitesimal positive test charge, Q0. This thing right here, we call it a test charge. Because if we want to test how strong the field is, we take a little teeny weeny charge infinitesimally small, we put it in the field, and we see what the force on it is. Um, so we place that test charge in the field, and we see what the force on it is. The test charge is made very small, infinitesimal in fact, so it doesn't affect the external field in which it lies. Now this is so important that we have to have a mnemonic for this relationship. The mnemonic is this. If you are in the electric field, in other words, let's say you work in electricity somehow, maybe you're an electrical engineer, Maybe you are an electrician, or maybe you work on uh, electric fields in biology. If you're in the electric field, like you have a job in the electric area, you are forced to overcharge by the association of electrical engineers. They're say, they always say, no, you can't charge that little for this, because then we'll all have to charge that little. So if you're in the electric field, you are forced to overcharge. That is just a mnemonic. It may or may not be true, but it's a mnemonic so we can remember that if you are in the electric field, electric field is force over charge. Force over charge. It is in newtons per coulomb. Just like the gravitational field is in newtons per kilogram, the electric field is in newtons per coulomb. And it's per coulomb placed in the field. Um, this is an especially useful aspect of the electric field concept. Just like the gravitational force can be expressed by mass times g, fg equals mg, you can express the electric force by q times e. So we can express the electric force as just qe, even if you don't know what's causing that electric field. So if we know what the electric field is, we don't even have to know if a charge caused it or if a, a changing magnetic field caused it or whatever it is. If we know the electric field, we know how it's going to affect other charges. 
So some examples, if the electric field is four newtons per coulomb and it points to the east in some point in space. So notice I need two things, I need the magnitude, four newtons per coulomb, and it points to the east. The force on a one coulomb charge, what will that be? Well, just think, four newtons per coulomb, it'll be four newtons, and it'll point to the east. How about the force on a positive three coulomb charge? Well, the field is four newtons for every coulomb, so QE is just gonna be 12 newtons. Four newtons per coulomb, there are three coulombs, it gives me 12 newtons. It will also point east, the force will point in the same direction as the field for positive charges. What if we put a negative charge in the field though? Negative 0.5 coulombs. Place that in the same point in space. What will the force be on it? Four newtons per coulomb times 0.5 coulombs. It'll only be two newtons, but it's a negative charge. Negative charges are affected oppositely that force will be west. So notice that our test charge is a positive test charge up here. Q naught is positive. So the field is defined by the direction of force and the magnitude of force on a positive test charge. Uh, you could even think of the field as how much force would be on a one coulomb test charge. The problem with that is though, one coulomb is a huge amount of charge, so we really wouldn't use a one coulomb test charge. We might use a uh, you know an infinitesimally small test charge, but the field is really how much force per coulomb would be on a charge that you put inside that field. We can use this now to define or to derive the equation for the electric field caused by a point charge. So this is we're gonna find the electric field caused by a point charge, or it will also work for a spherically symmetric charge of total charge Q. So we've got a charge Q, or we got a sphere of charge Q that's uniform. The electric field is, by our definition, it's the force per unit charge. Here is the force due to a charge Q, okay? It's KQ, Q naught, remember it's a force on our test charge over the center to center distance squared, but it's, you divide that by the, the charge that we're putting in the field. So the field, due to our charge Q, this charge right there, is simply, you just do the math here, and it's quite simple, you get KQ over R squared. So this is the field caused by a charge Q. In other words, I've got a charge Q right here, here's Q. I've got my really tiny test charge right there. That's Q naught. And the question is, what's the force per unit charge on there? This is the field caused by Q. It's the field caused by this charge right there at a distance of R away. So that's the field caused by Q right here. That is the equation for the field caused by Q. Now, very important to understand this, uh, what must be the field at the center of a uniformly charged sphere? Uh, this is really important to understand because otherwise everything becomes very confusing. What's the field at the center of a sphere like this, uniformly charged. Well, you could say, well, this, if I put a test charge right in the center right here, put a test charge Q naught right there, Q naught, well, this charge is pushing it away that away, but the, this charge is pushing it away that away. This charge is pushing it away that away. This one right here is pushing it away that way. When you add up all these chart, these forces, the net force on this test charge is zero. It's true at the center, and it's actually, if you're in a conductor, it's true everywhere in the, within the substance of that conductor that the electric field strength is actually zero inside here. E equals zero. Uh, and that makes good sense. This thing cannot push itself around. I can't push myself down the street by exerting a force like that. Neither can a field, due to this thing, due to this charge, push the charge. What if I had a point particle? 
here's, let's say this is an infinitesimal point. What's the field that is caused by this particle itself at the position of the particle? Well, you can see that that would have to be a field of 0, 2. Uh, and we have to do it that way because otherwise, if r is 0, this blows up and we'd get an infinite field strength there. So we just say that just like for a spherical charge, a, the field due to the charge itself where this charge is at is 0. Uh, this cannot push itself around. So this causes, this charge right here, causes uh, no field at its own location. And just like this spherical charge causes its field to zero in there, you can just say, due to this itself, the field that it causes itself is zero. Now, it can, it can cause other particles to have forces on them. It's a positive charge pushed that way. But at the point where the charge is it at itself, we have to say, well, it cannot cause a field that it itself is affected by. So we have to use the number zero. Otherwise, our math completely blows up. And it makes sense just like the way the field is zero at the center of this one. What I want to talk about next is what is called superposition of E fields, where uh, two or more charges are cause, each causing E fields. Uh, we have to add up the E fields, and we have to do so vectorially. And this is what this equation means. Let me show you exactly what I'm talking about here. Let's say we have two charges. I'm going to call this charge right over here. I'm going to call this Q1. This is Q1. And I'm going to call this charge over here Q2. It's a smaller charge. Smaller charge. Now, if I have some point in space, let's say I want to look at uh, this point right here, right there, let's say. That's a, just a point in space. I want to figure out the field right at that point. I've got to add up the fields due to each of these individual charges. So I've got a field right here. And I'm going to call that E1 because it's due to Q1. And I'm going to call this E2. It's due to Q2. Notice that the direction uh, I'm indicating has got to be along the center to center line between this point and that point. It's a little bit off. but uh, Now notice that uh, how do I know that this E2 is smaller in magnitude than E1? Well, all I did is I noticed that Q2 is smaller, and it's farther away. This is this distance right here. We'd have to call that maybe R2. And this distance right here, we'd have to call that R1. So all this equation right here is saying is that what you do is you add up K times Q1 over R1 squared. And that's in the R1 hat direction that's repulsive along the line of R1 that way, that's E1. And then you add vectorally K times Q2 over R2 squared, and that's times R2 hat, in other words, along the line of R2. When you add up these two vectors uh, to do so, uh, pin the tail on the head, here's E2. And then I pin on that, pin the tail of E1 onto that, right like that, this is E1, and then pin the tail on the head, what do you get? This vector right there, that is our net electric field due to those two vectors. And you can have many, many charges contributing to an electric field at a point. Uh, if you have a continuous charge distribution, and this is only going to be true if we are in AP Physics C, is the only time you got to deal with something like this, uh, a continuous charge distribution, in other words, uh, a, a whole object that's charged or it's got charge distributed through it, if we want to figure out the field due to that charged object uh, that is not a sphere uh, or it's uh, not spherically symmetrical, we have to integrate, add up an infinite number of infinitesimal fields. That's fun and we'll do that later.